Hello students. So, today we have come to the last module of the course on test that is basically we are going to today discuss on testing of, of embedded software systems. Till now in the whole phase of the lectures on testing you might have observed that we are talking of embedded hardware in which case uh, as we already discussed in the previous lectures that basically in embedded systems we first make a partition of a hardware and software based implementation and then we have uh, assumed that the hardware part of the implementation is made up of ASIC by ASIC I call application specific ICs where we are uh, giving these basically the proper flow that is where we are saying that this is the specification this is how to be implemented and then this fabricated. After that we are uh, dealing with such type of systems where after the hardware part of the embedded design is freezed we manufacture it and then basically we find out test patterns and ways to apply and test those specific hardwares. So, that was our as assumption till now, but in the last two basically lectures I mean uh, we cannot go to a very vast details on these two parts because these are more or less slightly uh, what do I say a newer part on embedded systems or I, I should say that basically more towards software hardware hybrid kind of uh, 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 implementation kind of stuff. So, basically what we are trying to do is that in these two lectures I will try to give you some directions and thoughts that how basically if some part of the embedded systems which are built on reprogrammable hardware APG in that case what happens basically. So, you download or the hardware is reconfigurable you can configure it to be an adder you can configure it to be a subtractor you can configure it to be a multiplier it can be a processor. So, basically you have to write the functionalities like a very log code synthesize it, but instead of fabricating it you can download and configure that hardware and it will become the, re 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 the prerequisite or basically the wanted you whatever the hardware implementation you wanted it will become like that that is what is the idea of a field programmable gate array or CPLDs or there are several other versions basically, but as of now APG is the most popular implementation of programmable hardware. Then basically how we should test such hardware or the programs which has been downloaded over there that is what is the idea of these two lectures, but again as I am telling you th this is all some of the uh, uh, we can say that the uh, some kind of a bit cornered part of embedded system design and test, but there I should not call it design, but rather test because in because mainly we are concerned when you talk about embedded system test we rather are more interested or more the literature or the work has been towards exact hardware implementation or which is called hard fabricated chips. We are mainly concentrating on that, but a major part of paradigm shift has now been coming by using of reprogrammable hardware of embedded systems. So, towards the end we felt that we should also give you some thought and directions in which research is going on in this type of platforms. So, as we all know, so basically there is a specification then the architecture hardware and software as their integration and test basically. So, basically what we were looking at till now is the hardware design and we are basically testing it from that perspective that basically there is a hardware we decide that is part of the uh, means part will be in the hardware design and we are manufacturing and we are testing it that is what is the main thing and that is what is widely expressed or practiced in the testing in testing or embedded system industry. That the idea is so if the hardware design in is found to be without faults the software part is verified as we have as professor Deka has already taught you then if you integrate it there should be very very less amount of faults possible. And in fact also in the next lecture we will try to show you that how we can also go for integration testing, but this is one of the very very complicated ways or complicated subject to understand and is a, it's also a very difficult problem to solve because hardware is done by one team software is done by another team uh, finally they are integrated integrated in the sense that the hardware is developed software is downloaded on that or software executes on that hardware platform and you have to find out if there is any faults due or errors happening due to integration. But again as I told you hardware is again tested to be free of fault, software design is verified to be free of faults then there should not be any kind of integration fault. So, therefore, it is expected that there should not be kind of any kind of integration error, but still some errors do occur and people have to find out, but this is a more involved topic. So, I will not directly go into details in this course on this integration testing, but rather I will try to give you some ideas in the next class that how we can use the software components to test the hardware design or, or basically the integration that will be the next lecture. But today what you are going to see basically this hardware design is also now become some kind of software control. Like uh, anyway I mean this is the, the, the part that this part is designed in hardware and this part in software, but if I look at it. So, you have a hard specification for the hardware part hardware architecture detail design integration and test. So, this is the hardware part, but say for example, if this hardware is also flexible. So, what do you mean by flexibility that basically first I thought that I will design a, a adder here and I will put all the multipliers in the software because multipliers are more hardware consuming. But then I after, after some iterations I thought that okay adder plus some more part maybe uh, at least uh, one two bit multipliers I will 
try to put it over here and the other part I will be putting in software. So, I can try to make lot of trade offs that is I keep on changing my ideas. So, before fabrication also I should should have a hardware paradigm. In fact, one thing I should tell you that integration testing was not possible till a very uh, uh, till about a f quite a few years back that was a not a nice possibility because you will get the hardware only when your, your chip has been fabricated and it has come to the market. But as of now there is something called FPGAs field programmable gate arrays in which case you can write your hardware in very long and you can download it it will become your required hardware. Of course, as is a prototype device it cannot be as fast as your real ASIC. Because FPG as I you will see is some kind of a general matrix kind of an arrangement all sort of gates with all sort of interconnects. So, you can change the interconnects you can download the level of interconnects you want and it will be configured to another. You can change the interconnects and the gates it will become a subtractor and so forth. So, of course, with such generality you can implement your uh, uh, hardware or your algorithm as a hardware, but it will not be as faster as a real ASIC or there will be lot of power consumption etcetera. But, this is a very good prototyping environment. So, if you have this hardware design in the initial goals of your design, you can download your software here and you can start testing whether the whole protocol system or whole system as an integration will test or not. So, nowadays this FPGA based designs are lot a lot being used in prototype testing or prototype co-validation, co-testing because now you at least have a hardware before the final fabricated chip is there. You can download the software and you can see whether it is operating in integration. Of course, at, at speed testing will not be valid cannot be tested over there because uh, speeds of FPGAs are not uh, cannot be of course, cannot match with a very high speed ASIC implementation. But of course, whole functionality can be verified and nowadays very large capacity FPGAs are available in which a processor can also be downloaded and it can be emulated. So, basically size is not a concern. So, with this new kind of designs are coming up. So, if for some cases your speed is not very high speed because I should not show that FPGAs are very slow, but it is uh, gigahertz level FPGAs may also be available in the market, but as which are called rocket IOs based FPGAs, but basically still I mean for many of the applications we do not require a very very fast ASIC device. So, an FPGA is more or less capable of handling the speed. In that case why I should go for ASIC fabrication, which is a more expensive procedure. So, what I can do I can take an FPGA with rocket and high speed IO, download my code there and I can say this is my ASIC, this is my implementation instead of going for a fabrication. So, nowadays many people, people are have started using FPGAs not only at the prototyping device, but also, also in the final design. So, that has brought lot of challenges in the embedded system market. So, if it is a prototyping device, I am not much bothered about the hardware correctness or hardware faults in the FPGA. So, if some faults are found in the FPGA or in the code, there will be bugs and then you can debug basically. So, if you find out that because you have prototyping stage, so you are more or less analyzing your implementation. So, you can find out that okay, your software design is fine or if hardware is also fine, but there is some manufacturing faults in the FPGA. So, it is not operating fine. So, in that context it is important to test FPGAs, but not of a major concern as in the case of ASIC based testing. But with the philosophy of now coming into picture where people are using FPGAs not only the prototyping device, but also the final product has making the test challenge much much higher. That is they are very large size FPGAs 10 years down the line FPGA capacities were very less. You can put only small modules and do the emulation and prototype test, but nowadays FPGA capacities are very very large. So, you can download even processors or in many cases you can put multiple FPGAs to implement a large very very large embedded system on the on a set of FPGAs which are downloaded in a board uh, which are fabricated and arranged in a per, per printed circuit board. But here of course, the speed is should be slightly lower or the application speed of those applications should be slightly less then such solutions exist in the market. But now, if for such applications people are not at all going for ASIC fabrication, they are taking FPGA, downloading the code, verifying everything is fine, they will make it the product and sell it in the market. So, FPGA testing has become very very important in that perspective. So, why do I call it as a software? Because if you look at the topic of this course, it is testing for reprogrammable hardware or in the context of embedded software systems. That is, in this case, I write a embedded software, I write a hardware and I do not go for fabrication rather in the soft version I have downloaded an FPGA and basically the software becomes a hardware. So, there is lot of flexibility or it is a more of I can say hardware software hybrid kind of a nature. So, we should that is why this lecture is focusing on testing of FPGAs which is some kind of a hybrid of embedded hardware and embedded software. Right. So, basically in this is a pure software is a pure hardware now in the detailed design basically now instead of an ASIC it is an FPGA. So, what is FPGA etcetera we will first see before we go to the details. So, this was our if you look at it the standard ASIC design flow 
uh, basically in which case we have a specification then we have RTL design then we have something called logic synthesis. Logic synthesis means all your RTLs will be translated into logic gates then there is a physical layout and finally there is a fabrication. Test plans of course come into the between. So, this is basically proper ASIC flow in which case you give a design you translate it into gates lay it out and finally it is fabricated according to your layout. So, once this layout is being done you cannot change anything it is a hard design. Now, basically as you will see if I do something like instead of going for a physical layout instead if I could have got something like a I can see a n cross n matrix like like something like this maybe I have a 4 cross 4 matrix and if I give the choice that any of the body can connect to any of the blocks and each of the block can be a AND gate OR gate NOT gate any gate it can be configured. Then it becomes something like a universal logic implementation or 4 4, four gate implement uh, universal logic implementation. Any gate can be converted to any gate and they can be incorporated in their own fashion. So, you can implement any logic circuit with these 4 gates. So, it is something kind of erasable and it is also erasable. Once you download it may become AND gate, this may become OR gate and so forth and the interconnection is done. You check your implementation then you switch the FPGA off everything will be cleared then you can again download another set of gates and uh, make another type of connection. It is something kind of a whiteboard. You can connect uh, any type of gates, you can do any type of connections, make it work and then you can, you can erase it. That is the beauty of FPGA. So, basically the idea of FPGA is a uh, integrated circuit that can be configured by the user to emulate any digital circuit as long as there are enough resources. That means of course, if it is a very very multi core processor that cannot be done in a single FPGA, but as I told you now what is FPGA capacity are very large even big processor cores are implemented in multiple FPGAs in a board level solution. So, now what is FPGAs have very large capacities. So, that is why not only it is used for prototyping it is also used as the final product, but anyway FPGA is basically a in the the main logic behind which the FPGA came into the market was basically an emulation platform. You can take a hardware, download it, see it is working, erase it, put another hardware. So, FPGAs can be seen as an array of configurable logic blocks means it can be configured to any type of gates and modern uh, FPGAs there are a lot of additional functionalities which can be configured right. You can have a simple uh, 2 bit adder, some memory blocks etcetera can be there. But anyway in this our lecture we will be limiting us to simple traditional FPGAs or some, some old FPGAs in which case basically we have it can be converted into any type of logic function there can be a it can be converted to a sequential function and so forth. So, basically FPGA can be seen as an array of log configurable logic blocks you can convert to any type of gates and with interconnect which are programmable because you can connect from any gate to any gate. Because in ASIC you tell that this is the AND gate, this is how it should be connected to the OR gate. But in case of FPGA, there is a full flexibility of N cross N connectivity is there. You can connect any gate to any gate by changing the fuses so that gate 1 gets connected to gate 2. In the next iteration, gate 2 may be connected to gate 1 and so forth by changing the matrix of connections. And any block can be converted into AND gate, OR gate in the iteration. So, it is a full fledged uh, reusable programmable hardware. So, you download a a bitmap or I call the connectivity and CLB configurations, it becomes one circuit, erase it, do another in down another thing, it will begin up another circuit and so forth. So, mainly, so that is why I called it software based embedded system application. You write a code, download into the FPGA, it will be get converted. Nowadays, runtime reform capable hardware are also available. This up to this point of iteration or implementation, this was an AND gate. After some time it is reconfigured it becomes an OR gate. So, runtime when the uh, embedded system is running on the hardware still the hardware can be reconfigured. So, by again it is a very very recent development in case of FPGAs, but the one we are discussing in the lectures are non reconfigurable runtime that means before you you have to erase the FPGA download your required uh, required configuration it will become a circuit then it will operate throughout its life, but again if you switch it off it will get erased and you have to again download the new code if required it will become another circuit and you have to go about it. So, it is not a runtime reconfigurable that is what was a traditional FPGA, but nowadays it is more powerful you can do this configuration runtime. So, you can understand the power of FPGAs. Nowadays as I told you it is have become a very very high uh, capacity FPGAs are their speeds are also becoming higher. So, many real life applications instead of being instead of using as a prototyping device people are downloading the original application and selling it to the market as an FPGA basically to save the cost of product development and uh, resources basically because fabrication is an expensive procedure. If some error happens uh, in the design you cannot do anything basically if, if, if some, some you made a design you verify it still you find out that some there are some error somewhere you fabricate it the whole product whole range of chips you have fabricated have to be thrown out it is a very expensive procedure. But if you do it in FPGA it is very very flexible. So, that is why FPGA is becoming a very very prominent hardware in the embedded system market. 
So, without telling more stories about the FPGA, let me tell you what it looks like. So, you have something called a CLB, then there is this is the interconnect because these are interconnect means if I want to connect this CLB to this CLB, it will be routed like this. For example, if I want to connect this CLB to this CLB, I will be connecting like this. So, the blue blocks in FPGA can be switched to make the connections. So, for another application, I may be liking to connect the first CLB to this one. So, S this SP SB will be responsible for doing it. These are switching matrix and of course, the black lines are basically nothing that I opens. So, there are this some IO blocks will be available over here, which will connect the FPGA to the outer world. Right. So, these are very simple architecture, more figure will be clear. Let me just zoom it. So, CLB is nothing but a very simple stuff like this. Of course, as I told you, again we are talking about the very basic FPGA, modern FPGAs are more sophisticated CLBs. So, there is a lookup table, the lookup table is nothing but it will implement your logics function. So, it can directly go as the output or it can feed a defeat flop. So, if this feeds a defeat flop, it becomes a sequential element and if you want to feed it directly to the max, it becomes a simple gate and also I can implement it as a simple max flip flop also. In that case, basically the max will send this value as the output. Right now, again, as an example, always an examples are better. So, basically, let me say that I want to implement a four input AND gate. So, this LU2 is nothing but a memory, as simple as that, because I, as you know, that memory is a universal logic gate. I, I, as you all know, you might have, if you have forgot, please go and read your digital design lectures. So, like for example, in this case, because a, a, a memory is nothing but a truth table, like in this case, if you look at a four input AND gate, I can have any other implementation. So, it is uh, all zeros will be there accepting a 1 because a four input AND gate. Now, what is this? I can think that this uh, this LU is nothing but a memory. So, in this case, this is the address bus 0000. zero, zero, zero so, this one will be addressed. Let me zoom it for you. It is very simple. So, all zeros means this first block, all 0, zero, zero, zero 001 this 1111 means the last element of the C, uh, LUT will be accessed. So, if you see, it is nothing but this whole truth table is implemented into this memory with this as the address bus, as simple as that. So, LUT is nothing but whatever gate or whatever logic you want to implement, write the truth table and convert it into a memory and that is done. So, basically this is the address bus and this is the memory. So, it is just by the address lines you can put it up. So, whatever gate this is an AND to input AND gate, it will be something like 0, 0, 0, 1. So, the input uh, the input lines will be A, B, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1. So, this will be the memory for the AND gate. So, two input AND gate. If it is an OR gate, basically it will be 0, 1, 1, 1. So, if both A and B are 0, 0, this is 0 for all other cases, the answer will be a 1. So, whatever logic function you want to implement, you have to write this over here, correct? Now, basically it has two outputs. So, the output will be fed to a flop or you can basically give it to the marks. So, if you want to just input a four input AND gate, so the configuration bit is 0. So, this is feeding as the output. And if you want to implement as a flip flop, it is very simple. You have to make this as a 1, right. And maybe whatever value you require, basically you have to configure this to all zeros. If you want to use as a single flip flop and whatever value you want to access has to be written in this cell. All others basically are do not cares. So, it is something like you make the configuration a 1. So, this one will be fed over here and all the inputs you make 0, 0 so that you can access the first cell. It can also be the last cell depending upon your APG implementation. Then whatever value you keep over here will be here. If you apply a clock, it will be coming over here. So, with this configuration, it will become a flip flop or with a simple configuration, it will become a simple logic function implementation as simple as that. So, this is basically a CLB. So, I think it is very clear to you that CLB is nothing but a or is a gate or some functional logic functional implementation or a simple flip flop. Now, this interconnection is very, very important because you should be able to connect in four directions. So, it is something like this if you look it is a uh, pass transistor based logic. So, in this case if you see if you if this part has to be connected to this, then basically this transition has to be made 1. If it is a 1, so it will be connected here again. In this case the di direction is a four line. So, it can be going to any direction. So, if I make this as a 1 as you can see, this is how the line is connected. If I want to make a connection from this to this, so I have to make this bit as a 1. So, this one will be the connection made. If I want to make a connection like this, it has to be a 1. Similarly, if this line has to come over there, you have to make it as a 1. But if these two lines has to be connected, it has to be made as a 1. If you want to connect these two lines basically you have to make it as a 1. Of course, you should check that there should not be any kind of shorts. So, as again the configuration is within your paradigm, you can select accordingly. So, this is basically nothing but a, a pass transistor logic which implements that any of these four directions can be connected to any directions as required. 
So, now if you want to implement a circuit, what you have to do is very simple. First, you have to configure the different CLBs by the values at the LUTs and what is the value of the marks input. So, that will convert all these CLBs to basically your desired logic gates and the connectivity you can very simply implement by basically changing the switch connection. Again, without telling stories, take an example. These are very, very simple circuit and I want to implement it. So, what I require to implement a AND gate, a XOR gate and a flip flop. So, I will try to do that. So, anyway, first you have to do a mapping. So, I uh, there actually we are having a flip flop and this connectivity. So, there are some as you see that LUT can be having a gate and a flip flop together, it can be a separately a flip flop or it can be another simple gate. So, in this case, it is a gate connected to a flip flop. So, you can directly take it over here. Generally, the idea is that as I told you, generally we do not have a single flip flop. So, this situation as I told you that making all these as XS, XS, making it 0 and this 1 or 0 whatever required, you can bring it here with a clock rarely arises because we do not have generally a single flip flop as an implementation. All flip flops are the combinational cloud behind it. So, this is the combinational cloud. So, in this case, the combinational cloud is basically a, a AND gate. So, you, you map it to CLB2. Again, this is CLB 0, this is an XOR gate, you have to map it to some other CLB. In this case, they have mapped it to CLB 2 and basically the CLB 3 is going to be the output basically uh, or because these or basically these three inputs are there, these are the two inputs over here and there is one input over here and basically you can take it as the, you can take it as the output over here or you can take it the output from some other CLB that depends upon your necessity. So, basically in this case two inputs for this one, in this case uh, if you look at it, so one the output of this first block this one will be should be coming over here, this is the input number 3 and this is basically mapped to the XOR gate and you can get the, you can get easily get the output from here or for some reason you can even bring take this output to other CLB depending on that. In this case for some reason they have taken the CLB output over here. So, now how do I configure? So, simple. So, let us look at the CLB 1. So, you have to convert this one into an AND gate. So, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1 and basically this is the case. So, let me zoom it for you. So, in this AND gate of course, all 1, 1 only the answer will be a 1. You have to make it as a 1 because basically it should be coming to the flop. So, very simple this is CLB 1 as simple as it, XOR gate. So, XOR gate means it is what? 0, 0, 0, 0, 1 and 1, 0, 1 and this is actually 1, 1. So, 0. So, simple gate, but in this case the flop uh, the marks has to be made 0 because I do not require a uh, flip flop over here, basically this should be the output. So, as sim very simply I can implement this to basically using two CLBs I can make the implementation of this circuit. Now, routing. So, as I told you the first implementation input 1 will go over here to this connection. So, this is what is being implemented over here, basically this connection, this connection I have implemented. So, this is what is the case. Now, secondly basically uh, uh, means input 2 is already there and this one I am as I told you somehow I am going to take the output over here. So, basically as before it should make a connection like this. I could have also taken the output over here, but anyway to show that two routing tables we are two routing we are using. So, anyway the example I have taken from the general this is a very general textbook material available in most of the textbooks on VLSI design. So, in this case they have routed it over here, but if you are if you want to take the output over here then this is not required and this is also not required, but if you want to take the output over here. So, SP 4 has to be made in this manner. So, that basically this is as a 1. So, the output is so this connection is done and basically this configuration basically is your implementation of the simple circuit like this. Now, what I have to do? So, you know that this is the configuration which allows to do. Now, what happens? Now, given an FPGA, you have to configure all these CLBs and SPs. You have to download the values. So, what I will do? In this case, important are CLB 0, CLB 2, CLB 3, maybe and SB 1 and SB 4, but all have to be downloaded because you cannot keep any of the CLBs empty. If they are not required, they can be XXX. I do not believe do not understand whatever you want to down you can download, but that is not of a concern, but important is whatever I am requiring for my implementation. So, if you will see CLB 0 means 0000001 000 000 000 000 000 000 that is the content and it has stored as a 1. What is that? So, it is this one is the configuration and this one is the bit. So, it is the input basically to the uh, LUT and marks marks is a 1. So, they have made a configuration like this. CLB 1 is basically if you look at an XOR gate. So, it was 0 0 0 1 1 0 that is the XOR gate and this was a 0 because the configuration was something like this because I want to directly take as the output without a flip flop. So, I will write like this. Other flip flops I do not bother basically then important is basically your SB 1. So, SB 1 is something like this which should be a 1. 
So basically, similarly, in case of SB1, you share this is a 1. These things I do not bother look at much. SB2, SB3, all zeros they have kept, means everything is disconnected, they have disconnected everything and SB4 also should be something like this. So only one bit is a 1, so in that case, this is SB4. So this is how the configuration has been done. So all zeros means every it is open, so it is not connected to anyone, this is also not connected to anyone. You can download, you can some make some arbitrary connections or sometimes you can keep it an open. So in this case, they have kept it as an open. So what I do, so this is what is something called a bitmap. So there are automated tools, you tell the design, this is the design I want to implement, it will automatically map your designs, first it will synthesize the designs, it will map it to the respective CLBs and basically it will find out what switches to be made on and what switches to be made off. So that the proper routing is done and then they will generate something called the bitmap which will be downloaded to the FPGA and basically your FPGA will become your hardware. That is what is actually called field programmable gate array. So why is we tell you the software based implementation of a hardware? Basically because in embedded system we first partition hardware and software. Hardware was manufactured ASIC so you cannot do much changes, software is downloaded in the hardware and tested or used in the community. But now we call it hardware software kind of a hybrid kind of an implementation because it is a, it, I have not fabricated a hardware, I have written a very log code or a hardware language code. Instead of making a hardware, I am downloading it to an APG, it becomes a hardware which implements the software, but it is a soft implementation. Some, some of the modern APGs, you can configure all these things in the runtime. Which part of the circuit is not doing its work, it can be reconfigured. That is a very modern concept. So, if any of the hardware can be reconfigured runtime, so it becomes some kind of a hardware software hybrid implementation or hybrid level of thought also basically. Hybrid implementation initially was thought as hardware is fixed, the software changes, but here the hardware software both changes. So, that is why APG has brought into a paradigm shift in embedded system implementation. But the course as present well we are not dealing with such high end APGs in this course. Our case everything is predetermined, you have to just download this. Uh, code, it will become your hard, so hardware. So, there is lot of flexibilities. Nowadays, I mean it, it, you need not partition your uh, I mean hardware software partitioning so uh, basically uh, drastically because I mean no changes can be done after that. Right now with APGs that assumption is no longer valid. After some time you find that some more part could have been gone to hardware or you can change the paradigms it is possible because FPGA is very, very flexible. So, that is why in this course we are trying to look at how FPGAs are also getting tested. So, anyway that tells you that what is an APGA. So, of course, we cannot do this manually, so there should be APGA EDA tools which will provide a design environment in which case it will hide all complexity like placement, routing, bitstream generation etcetera. You just give the circuit, it will automatically map it to the CLB respective CLBs, it will make the automatic routing, it will generate the bitmap, it will be automatically downloaded and you will get the circuit implemented. The lot of APGA tools like Xilinx, Mentor Graphics, uh, Altera, there are many lot of vendors, I, I think many of you may be knowing who are into this APGA business. So, there is very simple, you write the code, synthesize it, after everything is automated. So, I am saying a typical Xilinx HDL flow. So, in this case, you write all the HDL files, then basically some of the synthesis constraints you have to give because what is the timing requirements, what is this space constraint you are putting and so forth. Basically, you take a target device. What do you mean by target device? Because APG has lot of variations of APGs are there. So, whether you are taking a vertex family, whether you are taking a Spartan family, what type of APG configurations you give, you have to tell that in this APG I want to synthesize basically or implement because some of the APGs are large, somebody have small, somebody are high speed. So, you have to tell which APG I want to use, then there will be it will be synthesizing your circuits not in terms of gates, but in terms of LUTs on the target device. Then basically what you have to do with this target because now you have all the a a LUTs targeted then basically uh, there is an automatic map and place route. So, this is actually synthesis flow in the ASIC synthesis flow basically you get a gate level implementation here you will getting a CLB level of implementation. Then basically with the CLBs you there is automatic uh, uh, implementation tools for the uh, uh, for Xilinx uh, from, from Xilinx and all other vendors. So, basically they will take your uh, uh, basically, so the net list uh, uh, basically uh, which are nothing but LUTs, they will uh, map it to the respective CLBs, they will place and route as I have shown you and finally, they will generate a bit stream which will be downloaded and it will become your hardware. Of course, I am not going into the design flow much because this is not a course on VRSI design, but this more or less is the flow. So, two figures I have shown you, this one example of a Xilinx FPGA and this board as you can see, they are not using for prototyping, rather they have put lots basically let me zoom it for you. So, rather they have put lots of FPGAs as you can see from Xilinx, like it can be from any vendor, they are putting it and it actually sold as a real product. That means, these APGs have some functionalities as a hardware which is not reconfigured, means they have downloaded it, they have verified it to be proper and they are not, is not used for 
uh, prototyping. Basically, they freeze it as its functionality and they put it as, a, as if it is an ASIC permanent hardware and sell it to the market. So, that is why the test of FPGAs are becoming very, very important. Now, let us see, let us try to focus and try to see what is the philosophy difference between a normal circuit test and a FPGA test. First of all, I could say that as I already a stacked fault model is a very well fault model. So, why should not I go for a stacked fault model or bridging fault model? Answer is not possible because there are no gates. So, in fact, there are all memories and multiplexers and basically some kind of a LUTs. So, that type of stacked fault model, bridging fault model, whatever I have told you is not at all applicable over here. Secondly, observability and controllability are very easy in FPGA. Why? Because this is fully reconfigurable. You take one block, make it test, the other block make it analyzer and switch it, something like best. So, in this case it is under test and this is under analysis. Then again maybe it, it can be test. So, both these blocks under test will give the answer to the third block, it will analyze the rest and you change the rules. So, here and he, here basically as I will show you ATPG is very, very trivial because the gates are very simple. There is a LUT, there is a D flip flop and there is a multiplexer. If you look at the CLB, there is only three stuff, LUT, D flip flop and multiplexer and there are some interconnects. So, and all the blocks are very, very symmetric. So, it is very, very, ATP is of course, very, very trivial by doing some 12 weeks with me as of now, I think you might have got a very simple idea that in this case the ATP will be very, very trivial, test pattern generation will be an extremely trivial procedure. And also testing is also very simple because you can maybe you can put some kind of another block to put the patterns, TP generation you can put over here, the same values can be given over here because as an advantage the box are symmetric, they are same blocks. I can put some test patterns from this block to the block under test, the same one I can fit my other block under test and the response I can to the analyzer block which is a simple XOR and you should be able to find out that both of the uh, blocks under test should give the same output because the, uh, basically the blocks are same in function. So, you just give same inputs, take the uh, outputs, XOR it and you should get same result and your job is done. So, whole ATPG of F or testing of FPGs are based on the simple philosophy. Give some, give some similar inputs to the both the blocks under test and they should give the same output. Instead of two blocks, you can give 3, 4, 5, 6, 10 blocks and they should give the same answers. Whichever block is giving a wrong answer, you can tag it to having a error. But the problem is reconfigurability because every time as I am saying, this is a block which will generate the pattern, this is a testing block, testing block, this is the analysis block. So, I have to download that configuration so that these blocks get reoriented in this fashion. Now, once this testing has to be done, I have to reconfigure. So, in this case maybe this one will be under test block, this may be the analysis block and maybe this may be the pattern generator block and this may be another block under test. So, role will be changing, orientation will be changing. So, every time one part of one testing is done, you have to again erase the FPGA, download a new bit file, so the reconfiguration is done and again you test and you have to test it. So, in FPGA the philosophy is slightly different. ATPG is simple, test application time analysis is simple. Only thing is that if you have to change the configuration of the FPGA for test, that is going to take long time because FPGA tests basically takes more amount of time because it is not about the applying of the test pattern or test pattern generation, it is because from mode A to mode B to mode C, the different ways of orientation as I have shown you, you have to do it to test the different con con uh, different components and from one configuration to another configuration test means you have to erase the FPGA, download a bit file, that takes time. So, now some people argue that FPGA testing should not be done at the ATE level, rather you can purchase it and you can do the tests at your, at the user location. So, there are lot of philosophy, but if some APGs are very high end exp expensive APGs, then you have to of course, do it at the ATE and then basically you have to ship it to the customer. Because APGs are mainly for prototyping, you will download the codes, you can test your APGA and then you can sell it into the market. So, lot of flexibility are here. So, many people say that I, I let the process of uh, downloading, reconfiguration, testing be done at the user end, because then you test an APGA, do everything, then you download your stuff, everything is operating fine, then you sell it into the market. So, some people, some want, some people tell you that you have to do in this way, if the APGA is cheap, but some other people also say that it is a very high end APGA, then it is quite expensive, then it should be done at the uh, ATE level before selling it to the market. Again, there are two types of APGA based testing, one is called application dependent, one is called application independent. What is application dependent? That is, I take an APGA, I download my required, required circuit, then, uh, then it will become my hardware, you test that that is called application dependent and this is called application independent that the raw FPGA is there, you verify that all the blocks are proper or not. 
So, the majority of the researcher, researchers are working on something called application independent testing. You get a raw FPG, quickly test it. Because if you are going to test an application dependent circuit, then basically it is a circuit. You cannot do much reorientation because the circuit is there. You have to test the circuit whether it is operating properly on the FPG or not. So, uh, some parts of the FPG will be not be tested and some of the parts of the FPG you should must not test it because uh, for a particular application certain configurations may not be valid. Main difficulty here is that the this there cannot be any structural testing in FPGA. You have to note the point that application dependent testing is difficult because it is totally dependent on the circuit itself. In case of ASIC, we were doing structural testing. Structural testing means you take a fault model and you do the test. But such as a stack, stack at fault model, bridging fault models are not holding fine in FPGA. So, therefore, you have to go for functional testing. So, if there is a functional testing in case of application dependent, FP, application dependent. Uh, FPGA testing, then the designer has to be there. Designer will look at the design, he will give you a test bench and that is basically nothing just like you are testing your C code. So, basically you will be having the FPGA, downloading the software into the FPGA and do just like I am doing a software testing, you have to do the F hardware of the FPGA for the test. That is like if you see all the loops are covered or not etcetera. Some of the philosophy we will look at tomorrow in the next lecture, but it is just like a normal software test. You download the hardware in the FPGA and that code basically you test just like because there is a very log code or a VSDL code which is downloaded to the APC. You test the code, a, a, but not in the soft level after it is downloaded to the hardware. So, therefore, uh, it is a kind of a full software based testing, more or less a software based testing and you require full designer knowledge for that. Because uh, stuck at fault models or the bridging fault models which we know basically are no longer that way validated much valid over such kind of application dependent test. But most of the test engineers are interested in application independent test. What is an application independent test? Raw FPG testing. So, therefore, test engineers are more interested on that. Today, we are going to look at application independent test. So, therefore, what are the different blocks in an FPGA? So, there is interconnection. So, there can be interconnect defect. So, interconnect testing is very simple. There are two wires. So, you send a 0, a 0 should come, you send a 1, 1 and a 1 should come. So, generally what happens either two lines or three lines get stuck together or the lines get opened. So, generally they call it open and stuck, uh, stuck type of a false. So, basically testing of this interconnects a simple model because anyway we are not going into details of full FPGA testing because that can be another course in itself. So, we are just going to take a very simple stuff that wires are there, you send a 0, you receive a 0, send a 1, 0 a 1. CLB, so you have to test the three components, the LUT, the flip flop and your multiplexer. So, you have to test it basically. So, it is very simple in most of the case again I am repeating the philosophy two CLBs you take keep the same inputs dump the outputs to a, a log, uh, basically an XOR gate and see if they match. So, it is very very simple philosophy of testing. Interconnect will be just sending the values here and there and there is something called IOB defect basically the if the input output pins. So, in kind of FPGAs the input output pins are also some kind of a blocks. So, there should also be some test principles for that. Anyway, in this course we are mainly limiting up to this because uh, IO blocks with scan enables boundary scans many interesting stuffs are there, but which we are not covering in the course for the sake of brevity. So, basically let us come because, because mainly in FPGA most of the textbooks or lectures you find mainly we are concentrating on interconnect and CLB level tests. So, this is your CLB. So, what you have to test? You have to test this, you have to test this and you have to test this. How to do that? So, uh, what are the different types of stuff in the LUT? You will have this sorry, you will have the LUT address lines and LUT memory cells. So, memory, test a memory. So, you have to test the address line that is the address decoder and basically your memory cells. So, generally this memory is not very large. In Xilinx, in most of the cases there are 4, 4 is to 16 LUTs are available. 4 bit inputs, 1 LUT size is each. But in the older generation member of this one, mainly we had 4, 2 bits LUTs. But there are lots of LUTs, so you combine them to together make a larger function. So, each CLBs are very, very simple. Flip flop, multiplexer, data input output that has to be checked in a CLB. So, the typical procedure is very simple. Repeatedly by implementing a configuration that is very, very important. First, you have to configure and alternatively apply an input sequence to the configuration. You take a configuration that this is the two testers, te block under test, you take the outputs, put it in an analysis block, some other from other blocks to give the input. So, that is a configuration. You take the configuration, apply the test patterns. Again, basically, a test pattern is represented a sequence of pair consisting of a configuration and an input sequence. This is very, very important. I will come back to this. So, basically, configuration. Download a test pattern or sorry, apply a test pattern, see what happens, reorient. Then again put another test pattern and check it. More or less the test patterns are similar. Some inputs check or take the outputs in XOR, XOR series, see if it is similar. So, here more important is the configuration. So, in this, in, in when you call about test of FPGA, basically it is two things. 
input sequence this is the test pattern as well as the configuration because configuration here actually takes the main time. So, most of the research in APJ testing is how to make intelligent configuration so that this testing can be done faster. Anyway as, as I told you we cannot tell about the full APJ testing in two lectures rather in this but I will try to give you some main ideas or very preliminary thoughts that how what configurations and how it has been can be done for testing. So, it is a simple logic we are again taking. So, let us test this two LUTs L, L 0 and 1 which we have taken. So, if you look at if you look at a very general sense. So, if you take a very general sense there are two inputs and basically 4 is a uh, 2 is to 4 memory. So, how many functions can be there 2 to the power 4 16 functions can be there standard theory, but should I should I be able to do all those tests you can do it, but it will take more time. So, basically you have to decide that same input. So, whatever input I will give to this same input I will be giving to this I will take the output by this marks I will take the output by and I will put a zone that is what is the idea. Same inputs I will give I will be giving to the both the CLBs outputs will be there and I will check it. So, as I told you for most of the cases the inputs are 2, but for high end APJs maximum 4 inputs for a single CLB. So, therefore, checking a sing single CLB is not very much complex basically, because the number of inputs are not too high. So, maybe 16. So, there can be 2 to the power 16 different functions, but still people do not try to explore all possible functions. All possible functions means this is one function. So, this can be all zeros can be one functions. So, n number of different implementations can be possible by a 4 bit 2 to 4 bit memory 16 different functions can be there, but people generally do not go about it you have to decide what type of vectors can be there. Maybe all zeros I will give over here and I will check that uh, this bit uh, all the matchings are there maybe I will put 0 1 1 0 as the op, this one is 1 0 1 0 here also 1 0 1 0 and I will do the test. Test means what I will first access this bit I will access this bit sorry access this bit and they should be equal. Next I will access this bit I will access this bit it will be similar and I will go for the 4 4, four uh, memory locations. So, it should be similar, but again the thing is that I cannot I, if I test for all zeros over here all zeros for here the coverage may not be high. So, I can be testing for all zeros for all ones alternative zeros alternative ones that is generally what people do, but most of the cases first they will test with all zeros then they will test with all ones. Generally two patterns they take pattern sensitive basically as I told you can take 0 1 0 1 and same thing you can try over here. So, different combinations you can try, but generally if you require more rigorous then you can try different combinations of the input, but most of the cases it is suffices with 0 0 0 0 1 1 1 1 important is configuration. So, this is simple you apply you keep all this series maybe this series and you start with this 0 0 0 0. So, here the answer should be this should be a 0 over here this 0 should come over and XOR should match. So, 4 combinations 0 0 0 1 1 0 1 1, but after this configuration has been tested I have to try with another configuration maybe the other configuration will be 1 1 1 0 this configuration I may be trying to test. So, now important is that it is very easy to apply inputs pattern as 0 0 0 1 1 0 1 1, but you want to change the content of the CLB then the whole APG has to be erased and new data has to be downloaded. So, that the value will be now 1 1 1 0 1 1 1 0 and that can be tested. So, therefore, in this case applying test patterns is not very important it is simple very very simple, but the whatever the value you want to put into the CLB for test that has to be done by a reconfiguration and reconfiguration is a very very time consuming process, but what is the another advantage? Another advantage is basically FPGA different CLBs can be tested in parallel. So, maybe this is actually the n cross n quite large FPGAs happen. So, maybe these are very large components. So, this one you are maybe maybe for test this is the test this is for analysis. Similarly, this one also can be parallelly tested analysis this thing right. So, this is another for test. So, the idea is that the APJ can be the CLBs of the APJs can be divided into chunks and basically they can be actually parallelly tested or concretely tested. That is why it's testing is fast. If it would have been the case that you have to take two, two CLBs, test it, erase it, again download another pattern, test it, then it would take have taken years to test the APJ. So, the advantage of APJ is concurrent testing, which is not possible in a uh, what do I say in a, AP, uh, in a uh, normal ASIC, whole ASIC has to be tested together in sequence, but in this case you make a cluster of different CLBs of the APGs which have to be tested and for each of the clusters you can test parallel like the example I have given you. Now, once maybe with this sequence you have tested you have to try for a different sequence or different combination in the LUT, then you erase the whole APGA, download different configurations maybe with the same clustering, but you change the values. 
So, that is why it is not very difficult if you think that it will take a long time to test the FPGA because if you have tested for one sequence then you have to test for another sequence everyone means this input combination can be given externally which can be very fast. But this is what is the content also should be changed. Changing that content means reprogramming that may take a long amount of time. But again thanks to the FPGA architecture things can be done concurrently. One set here, one set here, one set here you make a cluster of the CLBs who are to be tested and who are to be analyzed make some common clusters and test in parallel. The idea is store predefined values in the LUT and retrieve black that is actually called application independent. Compare the responses with multiple multiple compare responses of multiple LUTs by XOR gates. So, you take you can take 10 testers together and 1 or 2 CLBs you can make as a analysis block and you just you make some clusters and you repeat it so that the testing happens in a concurrency. How you can take the D flip flop is also very very simple only thing is that basically in this case the configuration has to be 1. So, may be 0 0 1 0 1. So, instead of directly sending as the flip flop you have to apply a clock. So, the value will be coming out for the multiplexer same thing you have to make as a 1 this value will come toward, toward the flip flop and you have to go for an x 1. So, it is very simple just like the normal uh, what do I say basically you are uh, uh, means uh, you are taking the CLB just taking the check testing the CLB here this is just the same thing instead of directly putting the CLB value as the output you just basically send it to a flip flop. So, just very very simple only thing is that you require a clock and that should be done synchronously. So, testing of the flip flop as well as your CLB is very simply done. What about the multiplexer is trivial as you know that this is what is the multiplexer fault model already we have discussed at length when you were discussing about high level fault models and basically it says that the conditions may be inter switched single condition may come out the second condition may cause the output as the permanent values, but in this case we have we will check for all combinations like 0. 0 0 0 1 1 0 1 1. So, maybe basically some one fault model is that in all cases this is what is going to come out this is never going to come out. So, but anyway if I am whatever the test I have told you for marks and CLB if you do it so the LUT you do it of course both the lines of the input lines of the marks will have been exercised also the configuration bit has been exercised the marks is auto tested. So, if you test for the flip flop and if you test the CLB sorry the LUT automatically the marks is already tested because this is a well known fault model of the multiplexer. So, as of now what do you have seen the idea is very simple that basically test patterns are very simple only it is non trivial that how you can apply it to all the patterns or it is more challenging that how you make clusters like for example, this one will actually clear it. So, in this case maybe he is trying to test concurrently number 7, 8 all the flip all the um, CLBs if you can see which are in grey color are been testing in concurrency. So, this is a pattern generator. So, pattern generator in this case is nothing but 0 0 0 1 1 0 1 1 all the bits of the CLB it is accessing. So, this is going to as an input to 7 the same is going to input as uh, 9 7 8 the thick line basically it is going to the input of 4 then it is coming back an input to 1 and 3. So, I same inputs are been given to 7 9 7 8 6 4 5 1 2 and 3. So, all the grey color FPGAs CLBs same inputs has been given by the pattern generator is nothing but 0 0 0 1 1 0 and 1 1 this is something like this. these are the cases. So, I am generating this all possible combinations. So, all the values and output of all these CLBs are actually fed to a XOR tree some blocks have been configured to an XOR block every if everything is normal everybody good should give the same output which has been torn as the LUT. So, if everything matching all the XORs are 0 fine any error somebody some of the some of the values are different there is a problem in the CLB. So, maybe I can this is the one way of testing it some some of the CLBs I am converting in the XOR gates which are not tested these are the analyzers and the pattern generator some of the CLBs I am using to generate the pattern analyzers it is called the PJ. So, this is one way of clustering now if you want to again change the rule. So, this one will be now under test maybe this also this will be under test this one will be also under test second this one will be under test this one will be under test all the blocks which have been tested now should be converted into analyzer and pattern generator. So, basically that is actually called configuration changing again repeating in case of FPGA testing pattern generation and application is very simple same patterns you apply to multiple blocks you should get the same answer and there can be an XOR to do it, but again again you have to reorient among themselves to change the rule. So, you have to do reconfiguration reconfiguration means erase the FPGA download the bit file which takes actually takes time. So, here the philosophy is slightly different. Now, last but not the least you have to check the switching matrix. So, switching matrix is very interesting. So, if you look at it this is the switching matrix. So, in this case as I told you the lines can go over here it can go over here or it can come over here it can come over here is a 2 cross 2 switches 
n cross n switches are also there, 4 cross 4 switches are also there. Similarly, this line can go by this way, similarly this can be going in by this way, similarly also we can have something like this one can be going by this line. So, basically this dotted lines are showing which pins can be connected to which pins. So, as I it, it is something like the I means any line can be going by this, it can be going to this, it can be also going to this. So, any line can be going in the four directions. So, it is a simple nomenclature they use west, north, east, south and if they say that E 1 can be connected to only other one. So, it can be connected to this, it can be connected to this and it can be connected to this. So, any once it can be connected, E 1 cannot be connected to S 2, it cannot be connected to W 2. So, that is a simple way of handling by and similarly for all like n 1 can be these bold lines you can see n 1 can be connected to here, connected to here, connected to here. So, n can be going in the three directions possible. So, for all the nets the same thing is possible. So, the 2 by 2 switch, 4 by 4 switches are also available, 1 by 1 switches are also available right. So, in this case it can be connected to any of the four directions. So, the all, all the numbers with same numbers are called connecting pins and where it cannot go like E 1 cannot be connected to S 2 they are called non connecting pins. Now, I have to just do see whether this connectivity matrix as well as the interconnects are fine on. It is very simple you make a connection all possible connections you make and then you apply zeros and ones to get it. Now, you may think there is a quite complicated type of connection lot of connections can be possible lot of permutations can be possible. Interestingly no basically for any before going to that let me tell about the fault models one is called the permanent connection and one is called the uh, permanent disconnection. So, what do you mean by permanent connection that means this two will be permanently short you cannot remove the connection. Permanent disconnection means you want to make this connection, but it will not be connected. So, this may be between the compatible lines. So, to do these are two compatible lines n 1 and s 1 may be directly connected or you may not be able to connect any point of time. Also, there can be a fault there is a permanent fault kind of a thing if say this one gets connected to this although I do not allow n 1 to connect to s 2 it can also be connected to this point that is that can also be an error. So, this is called permanent connection a short between any two non connecting pairs and between the compatible lines there can be uh, open. So, you want to connect is not connecting and permanent connection means you want to open it it is not opening. Now, very interestingly all combinations must not be tried or rather need not be tried only by three configurations everything is possible. What are the three configuration it is called orthogonal you are by straight one is by diagonal and this is called actually diagonal two type of a connection. Why three basically if you look at this point can be connected to here this point can be connected to here or this point can be connected to here. There are the only three ways a connection can be possible similar for the whole other modes. So, I should be able to see if all the possible connections are exercised properly or not. That means, I will give a 1 I should get a 1 I should give a 0 I should get a 0 that is it. Similarly, 0 0 0 0 1 1 1 I should be able to repeat it for all. So, Sequentially again the beauty of FPGA testing is that sequentiality is not required parallelly I can check 0 0 here also 0 0 0 0 I should be able to get it. Similarly, I will parallel I will put 1 1 I should get a 1 I put a 1 I get a 1 I put a 1 put a 1 I get a 1 I get a 1. Similarly, sorry I can get it parallel. So, in one configuration all such connections will be take, checked. Next I will go for this connection and apply parallel testing putting all the 1 1 1 1 1 and get the value put 0 set and this is another connection. So, by three connections three co different configurations I will be able to test the all types of faults permanent disconnection permanent connection. Permanent disconnection means what you apply a 1 over here basically you are it is disconnected you are going to get a 0 over here and that is actually called a disconnection based test right. So, I am not going into the very detailed theory why only these three there, there have been formal proofs that tells that by only these three connections you can test all the different type of fault models in case of these interconnections, but I think I have been able to give you a philosophy that a point can be connected to either this or this or this and I by applying zeros and a 1 C properly they have been transmitted to the counterpart all faults are basically kind of tested and I can do it in concurrence. This one this three configuration this configuration and this configuration are three different configurations, but I can take this line check this line this line this line in one go. Similarly, this 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 I can test in one go and these four I can test in one go. That is the beauty of FPGA test you can apply concurrency. Now, that this has been shown basically in this slide that what is simple that is a sender and a receiver you send a 1 you should receive a 1 you send a 0 you should receive a 0 then then you call open and all you are not going to get it that simple analysis can be done. So, this may be one CLB this may be another CLB this is pattern generator and this is pattern analyzer. So, similarly this can also be PG this can be PG. So, uh, 
yeah, just you send one zero, then your job is basically done. Of course, there are bridging fault models also there that if these two lines are bridging and all. So, advanced fault models also do exist for this kind of interconnect test. So, slightly complex test patterns will be applied, but again the interesting fact will be it's very much much simpler compared to normal combination or sequential ASIC. Only problem is that whenever you have to go change to go from one configuration to another to another configuration to another, it will take time because FPG has to be erased, new bitmap has to be downloaded. But test application is very simple because all these LUTs, whatever these blocks, all the blocks which have been placed in different parts of your FPGA can be that uh, connectivity blocks can be tested in parallel. That is what is the beauty. Disadvantage is configuration changes are required, it takes time. But beauty is that lot of concurrency can be possible. Like here I have shown you this one example which will and some, but sometimes people also call scheduling, con, uh, this is uh, 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 test application as well as scheduling, configuration and scheduling basically. For example, say you can see that this guy is giving us input, this guy is giving the output and this guy is going to test it. Similarly, this is also giving an input to this, this guy is blue or under test and this guy is actually doing the analysis, this is under test, under test, under analysis. So, basically it is being test, it is testing. So, basically it is analysis, it is analysis. So, this is one configuration. In the other configuration, it just the roles are reversed. So, you have to properly configure and properly schedule that which node will be in test mode and which node will be in uh, the analysis mode. And you can see because of the symmetry, similar test patterns can be given and lot of parallelisms can be obtained. So, there is uh, this one way of testing. Some people also thought in the other way which is called global input output. Like instead of basically putting this test analysis or everything in a single on the APGA itself, they try to make a global connection. Like this is one configuration of different connecting blocks. So, you can see this input will be going over here, this will be going over here, this input will be travelling over here, travelling over here and coming at the out output. So, this is one way of travelling. So, in this case basically what they are trying to do, they are trying to basically see in this case also you can see this is going to the input output. Then in what is this matrix basically? They are trying not trying to put any analyzer on the chip itself. What they are trying to do? They are trying to make full utility of these blocks, apply the test patterns over here and get the test pattern out going to the output of the chip by different configurations of your connectivity blocks. So, in this case what, what, what is the thought behind this is analysis and test pattern generation are keep off chip. So, in this case what happens? Uh, basically the idea is that number of configurations will be less. So, here what happens as if, if you look at it, so the roles are being continuously changed, analysis, testing, analysis, testing. In this case, all are under test. So, basically what happens, all the test patterns are applied over here and these are given at the outputs. So, your AT is the test pattern generator, this is your TPG and this is your response analyzer, which is off chip. So, in this case, the number of test configurations will be less, but again, uh, not, nothing is a magic in any any science. So, in this case what happens basically test pattern generation is complex, there can be lot of controllability observability problem just like because they now become a combinational or a sequential circuit because test patterns are applied from the output uh, input and the out and the uh, values go out the out output and you have to go a match in the AT. Now, normally it becomes a normal sequential or combinational circuit test. Problem here is that there is no standard fault model like your stack at fault model or bridging fault model etcetera. So, even if you say that con configuration and global I O you can use a technique where you can, can you should not change the roles like in the previous approach basically some block is tester, some block is analyzer. So, in this case to avoid such reconfiguration all the inputs are given from the AT, proper routing is there and all the answers are thrown out of the chip so that you analyze outside. But again as I told you here ATPG is more complex, test pattern generation is more complex over here, application is simpler, analysis is also simpler because they are off chip. But test pattern generation and basically what values to give what controllability and observability is a major problem because there is no standard stack, and stack fault, st standard fault model. This is a more challenging way of handling it, but still I just mentioned it to you because this was another direction of thought that if I try to bring every output to the output world and try to do the test. The major problem as I told you, uh, uh, again one thing I forgot here basically in that case, here th this type of circuit is more suitable, this type of architecture is more suitable if you are testing for a application dependent FPGA. In this case, you are one of the beautiful thing we found out of the FPGA testing was a symmetry, same pattern can be applied to all. So, that was actually bringing up the beauty of concurrency based test, but if the application dependent circuit such concurrency will not be there because all the modules will be implementing different different functions. So, in this case maybe this global sending the value, taking out the value will be a easier way of solving the problem. But again repeating, this is not as simple as you are doing in normal, normal sequential and combinational ASICs because there is no standard fault model. 
So, with this we come to the end of this lecture. So, what we have found? NTPG is very trivial in case of APGS. Same for all LUTs or all kind of this routers. So, it is simple parallel testing. Important is intelligent configuration for faster tests. So, you have to reorient very quickly and you should do minimal reorientation. So, or in one orientation or in one configuration you can do maximum testing. So, that is why many people and of course, means more or less a this kind of an architecture because on chip uh, trace pattern generators and resources are on chip. Some of the CLBs are configured, some of the CLBs are actually configured into test response analyzer. So, basically APGS testing is some kind of a best in itself, but still as a, and again as I should mention in the end that this type of architecture in which case the inputs and outputs are from the external world in a APGA are basically mainly applied for application specific or application dependent APGA. So, with this we come to the end of this lecture and I should again tell you that we are here in this two lectures will be just showing you the tip of the iceberg, because a embedded system based or programmable devices based APGA implementation is slightly a newer concept and lot of work has to be still done or is being undergoing. So, we are in these two lectures we are not going to the entire picture we cannot give you, but rather we will try to show you in if you are having reprogrammable or hybrid kind of software hardware co-implementation in APGA in which direction or what is the paradigm shift required. So, with this we come to the end again and the next lecture we will try to see something more on testing of application dependent APGAs or if you have a some kind of a processor in the APGA or in the hardware itself, how it the software implementation can be used to test itself. So, thank you.